So, yes, I'm from Clanny in Western Australia, in the northeast of Wheatbelt, about 260 kilometres from Perth. It's a um, fourth generation family farm, settled in 1922. Heavily uh, married to Amanda, thanks for the support. In the last 12 months, it's been brilliant with three, three kids. Um, Clanny is char characterised by low land values of about $250 an acre, which is low by in Australian and international standards. So just a bit of an idea about our cropping program. We're about 12,000 hectares a year, a year of wheat, canola, barley, and about 3,000 hectares of what was traditionally pasture running sheep, but is tending more towards fallow now. The photo, that's my brother Daniel and, and some of the cousins. Um, thanks to Daniel for covering, covering one our way. And Daniel, that's probably one of the reasons also why our business is successful, because we've been able to stick together as a family. We get on and we've been able to get all, all the benefits of that. Thanks to Jimmy the dog, um, yeah, especially for keeping all the rabbits out of my veggie patch while they're away. <laughs> We've been no-till um, since 1994. We used to grow a lot of, lot of legumes, uh, pulses, lupins, but because of the dry years and we've got a lot of salinity on our farm, we've stopped growing them about five years ago. Just, just a few figures for the cropping guys out there. But we've had a lot of luck with canola and we've been increasing our um, hectares over time up to now, where it's a significant part of what we do. Our recent business focus has been expanding and trying to gain the economies of scale and purchasing more forgiving soil types. As Nick said, the lighter soil types, the sandy loams, that are, yeah, that's basically the proper driver in these dry years that we're now having. And the big one, increasing paddock size, removing fence lines, trees and banks, and trying to, yeah, for weed hygiene, also for our day-to-day um, -day machinery efficiencies. Thank you so much to Nuffield Australia and to the Grain, my sponsor, the Grains Research and Development Corporation. I've, I felt pretty honoured to be sponsored by the GRDC, so I've got a love of crop agronomy and R&D. Thanks to our GF, GF, GFP group, the eight fantastic people. The picture there is when we were at Cimit in Mexico, Mexico, standing in front of the statue of Norman Borlaug. And the other photo, that fantastic feeling of being re reunited with your suitcase after a couple of days of meetings without it. So these two photos highlight the issue. On the left, in 2002, we had 90 millimetres of rain for the year and didn't get our seed back. And then on the flip side, in 2008, we had 340 millimetres of rain, a fantastic season resulting in a 45% return on equity. Since the end of the 90s, our 10-year wheat average has dropped by about 250 kilos to the hectare. And at the same time, we should have had at least 10% in productivity gains from the likes of new genetics and technology. This, this photo highlights really well what's happening in the southwest land division of Western Australia. The, the um, inflows into Perth dams, you can see at the start of the 70s there was a really big drop off and again at the start of the 2000s it's really dropped off again. I gave a talk at the drought, US Drought Mitigation Centre in um, Lincoln, Nebraska and they actually use this graph to teach their students urban planning about, what, about um, water management. So it shows what's happening in WA is significant, not just here, but in a world scale. So for our business, the best way to manage risks is to manage costs and in turn have a low break even yield. Um, we used to, at the end of the 90s, it was all about producing more, but we've really, we've changed our emphasis now to producing the same for less. Because of our low land values, we can, the laws of diminishing return, we can chase that first part of profit, the low risk part of profit, and combine it with economies of scale. But when you travel around the world, there's been massive appreciation in land values, like the, the good areas of Australia. So to compete, you've got to chase that top part of profit, the high risk of profit, and with that comes a lot less risk. I travelled um, through the US and I went to the Lands Institute in Salina, Kansas and looked at what they were doing with perennial grains, perennial, perennial grains, perennial wheats and perennial, perennial oil seeds. The photo there compares the um, root system of conventional wheat with, and perennial wheat. So perennial wheat is a perennial grass crossed with a conventional wheat and you can, show, you can just see by that fantastic root system, they're really good at 
extracting moisture and nutrients are dead. The whole idea with the, the percentage of, of, of yield from a perennial was lower than the conventional wheat, but you actually you, you end up with more biomass, so a bigger pie, so a smaller slice of a bigger pie than conventional wheats, but in theory you can potentially end up with the same result. But are a little bit dis disappointed with, with where they're at. There's a lot of issues. They shed, they mature unevenly. There's too much gluten to be gluten free, not enough gluten to make, to make bread. So it's a long way away. In the, like on, on a broad acre scale, it's a long way away, but there might, there's potential maybe within 10 years for small area, areas to be grown to value add and for niche markets. Another reason with the perennial grains, we're getting, as our variability has increased, we're getting a lot more out, out of season rainfall. The Southwest um, Land Division of Western Australia has traditionally had one of the most reliable winter rainfall patterns in the world, but we're getting more, more and more out of season rainfall and perennials could hopefully capture more of that rainfall. Alternative oil seeds. I, I travelled through Canada looking at the alternative oil seeds. By nature, the mustards should be more drought, more heat, and more shadow tolerance. So it should have a, a fit in theory. The photo there is of Agrosoma carinata. It's an Ethiopian mustard um, developed by Agrosoma for the jet fuel market. That, 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 that's at the Chinook Applied Research Association in the special areas of Alberta, Canada. That was a really unique area that had a lot of similarities to home. In the, you know, the dirty 30s, the Dust Bowl years, um, a lot of growers, like about 70%, walked off the land and the ownership resorted, reverted back to the government, was planted back to the prairie, gar uh, the prairie grasses. It's still owned by the government and then just leased back to graziers. So with our um, lack of diversity options in clay, stack, re stack um, rotation is the next best option. That photo there is at Ag Canada in Lethbridge, Alberta. That, that plot is of seven years of continuous canola. After seven years, the, um, the yield is only 20% lower than what the ideal rotation of, say, canola after field peas. And in Canada, they're achieving about 80%, well, up to 80% of their wheat, wheat yields with canola. So, whereas in Australia, we're about 50% of our wheat yields with canola. So, still after seven years, that is the most profitable rotation. The other photo is with um, Bob Blackshaw, that's in a, um, a rotation trial been running since 1910. And when I was there, I told Bob we didn't grow legumes and Bob said you'll be broke in 10 years from now if you don't start growing legumes. It's, we've already gone over five years and our profitability's probably been as good as ever, so I hope you're wrong, Bob. So I'm seeing that that's just something we've brought back to Clanny and tried this year. It's a paddock that was in canola last year. We've split it in half. Half's gone back into wheat, the other half's gone into canola again. Next year it'll all go into wheat. So then we'll be able to get the data and just test the more conventional rotation of canola followed by two wheats versus two canolas in a row followed by wheat to get the double break. And the idea of a double break, two years you can really clean up weeds, really clean, clean up disease, and then you can go into a continuous low cost cereal phase. And at the moment we're doing that with either pasture, then canola, or fallow, then canola, but it's just another way of achieving it. Oh, and with the idea there, we'll grow a TT canola first, followed by a Roundup Ready canola, so you won't utilise the, excuse me, John, you're falling asleep, um, so you won't utilise the first, you won't utilise the same chemistry twice in two years, and you utilise the superior black leg resistance of Roundup Ready second. So GM and the Eastern Wheat Belt. At the moment, GM adds a lot more cost. And canola works so well because like, we'll retain our own seed and it costs $2 a hectare. If we grow a GM crop, it's $50 a hectare for the seed. So that, in turn, adds extra cost. So going forward, if we could have multiple traits in our canola, then hopefully the reward would outweigh that extra cost. So a couple of ideas would be omega-3, the long-chain fatty acid that's been developed by the CSIRO in, um, in Australia. And another thing I looked at, went to Biosears in Argentina, who have developed the HP4 gene, and they're hopefully going to commercially release it next year in wheat. It adds drought and salinity tolerance. Because the same, same gene affects both salinity and drought, because salinity, salinity basically inhibits the um, cell's ability to, to bring in moisture. So for us, that would be absolutely brilliant. And also, like, shatter tolerance. 
And then if Richard's at the back of the room, and another really good idea, at the moment when we pay all our, front, all our costs buying seed up front, up front, but if we could have more of an endpoint royalty system where basically the seed companies and the growers share, share, share the risk would be fantastic. So, thanks Richard. Okay, back on board. On the photo there, that's of canola, GM hybrid canola production in Alberta. Um, so you have, they need bees to fertilise the crop and they use the, um, the leaf cutter bee, which is a really lazy bee. So what they have to do is put hives or those little tents right across the field so the bees will pollinate the whole paddock. So health is everything. Um, acidity in the West, Acidity in the Western Australian wheat belt is a really big issue, and the soil types that are affected are this, the lighter soil types, the, the soil types that are now our forgiving soil types and the most profitable in our dry seasons. So, just a couple of things I looked at. This was the Veris 3000. It's a machine that accurately um, pH maps paddocks. So, while it's moving along, a plunger goes down, grabs some soil, lifts it up into a probe, takes a test, drops it. The tank of water on the back washes it down it goes and grabs another another sample so you can get really really accurate maps and for that expensive dollar spend on line you can really accurately pinpoint it across the paddock and on the flip side the other photo that's in kenya in the um in the rift in the rift valley a calcium carbonatite it's an igneous rock and it's got about 95 percent neutralizing value and just the contrasting technologies it's mined by hand crushed by hand screened and bagged by hand and then spread by hand on the small plot landholders, they recognise the, um, the need for lime, which is very contrasting technologies. Just going back to our farm, that's what we've, this is the solution we've found. This was a really poor, heavy soil type. It has a high neutralising value we tested, about 50%. So now we're effectively, we're mining this and then spreading it on the lighter, more productive soil types of our paddocks to fix the um, parts of our paddocks to fix the acidity issue. We're spreading it about four tonnes of the hectare because it's half the neutralising value of the lime sand from the coast, which is in the 90s. And where Nuffield comes in now is this has had a lot of interest, and Nuffield's taught me the value of sharing information and the skills to go and extend what we're doing there to the communities in the wheat belt of WA. The topical crop insurance. And so we, for a long time, we've been able, we've been able to insure our crops for like uh, hail and fire. But in the US, they have their um, farm bill, their crop, in, their, um, their subsidies basically pays for their crop insurance scheme. So they have full insurance for production. Now at the moment, you know, there's a lot of talk and there's, there's companies now offering multi-peril crop insurance in Australia where you can insure for complete production. But the problem is it costs a lot of money and those in the most unreliable areas that most need it, don't have a yield history to obtain a premium that's palatable. So I guess the question to you guys is, is it the answer or do we look at other ways of managing the issue? And for us it's like controlling cost or would it be, is R&D say the answer? Rather than mopping up the effect of frost, we use R&D to try and actually find a solution to fix the problem in the first place. The graph set, that's it, uh, um, Goodwell in the panhandle of Oklahoma just the yield variability they've got there on their way to a lot greater than what we've got in Kalani. So just a few recommendations. We need our farming system to be profitable in our decile three and four rainfall seasons, which are now, now the norm. When traveling, you know, the grass is always greener. It's a bit of a malign part of Australia where we come from. Didn't know how I th feel when I got home, but coming home, it's a great spot, there's a lot of opportunity on the back of, you know, there's no outside influences on property prices, it's cheap property prices, it's actually, it's a good spot to live. So what's Nuffield all about for me? It's getting out of the box and looking back in at the same set of issues with a fresh perspective and it's been absolutely brilliant. That's on the, the photo on the left, that's on the Argentinian pampers and just discussing the issues. I think I'm explaining there our seeding system back home and. On the flip side, that's um, Wayne Dredge when we're, we're on the um, east coast of Kenya, teaching local Islamic fishermen another way to tie up a fishing net with just a wave in it, so when they when they swim along the edge, they get caught. Just simple things, and that that's what Nuffield was all about. It's not just gaining information, but it's sharing information. 
So thanks again to the GRDC and Nuffield for what's been a fantastic year.